Well, we welcome you to yet another uh, segment in our study of the book of Revelation. And we've already covered chapter 1 where we saw John introducing himself and then John describing a glorious vision that he has of Jesus in the church. Now, we're about to go into chapters 2 and 3. And this is the epistle part of the book of Revelation. Seven churches were to receive seven messages. And the book of Revelation was to be rotated and passed around all seven of these churches so they could all hear these messages. But God is speaking directly to each one of these local churches. And yet he's speaking beyond them. He's speaking into our day, into our lives as well. Now, before we look at the first of these churches, which is the church at Ephesus, uh, found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, let me give you a pattern that you will see in Jesus talking to these seven churches. Now, if you go back to the vision of Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks in chapter 1, you see him described in various ways. And now as Jesus is addressing each of these uh, seven churches, he will repeat something of the description of himself in each one. And so chapters 1 through 3 are all tied together as a literary unit. Now let me just share with you the pattern that you will see emergent. And I think it will be a great example as to how to deal with people. Each letter, and there are some exceptions, you can see them as we go through them, but there are basically five elements in his message to each church. Now a couple of them leave an element out, and you'll see that as I said as we go, but here, here they are. Uh, beginning with a portrayal of Christ. He addresses the church, and then he says something about himself, a portrayal of Christ. That's number one. Number two, then, he praises the church for something. He notices something they've done or something very good and positive about that church. So there is, number one, a portrayal of Christ. Then number two, praise to the church. And then number three, he'll say, but I have this against you. He exposes a problem. And after he uh, describes the problem, he then gives a prescription, how to fix the problem. And each of these letters to the seven churches ends with a glorious promise. Now, before we go any further, I would like to just say as a side, side note, this is a pretty good way to deal with people. Number one, see what God is doing in them. Is Christ in them? Are they a Christian? What is God doing in them? Uh, see something good about them. Tell them something good about them. And if you're having to confront a problem, then very clearly state that problem. But don't state the problem if you're not also willing to give a prescription or, or a way of solving that problem and then find some promises of God to end with. What a great pattern that is in, in terms of how to deal with people and confront people and deal with situations. Well, we're going to see that first of all and let's look at the very first church we're going to deal with is the church at Ephesus. Now Ephesus was um, a very glorious city. And uh, just to give you a little background of the city, it was a, a commercial center. And as a commercial center, it was very busy and uh, people were coming there from all around the world. It was a harbor city. And this is very important that we understand uh, this message. Something about the city itself. Because in each one of these messages to the churches, there's something about the city's history that ties in to the message. It's fascinating when we see it. But it was a port city. And it was a very deep porter, port, a deep water port, which means large cargo ships could come in there. So there was a lot of commerce, there was a lot of trade, there was a lot of people coming and going. Uh, and it also was a religious center. The Temple of Diana was there. And uh, people from all around that part of the world would come to worship there. And we see this in the history uh, of the book of Acts also of what took place in Ephesus under the ministry of Paul. But here's something very significant, and that is that it was also where we believe John himself had pastored, and Timothy also had pastored there. It was founded by Apollos. We know this in Acts 18 and 19. Uh, Paul pastored there for two and a half years. Uh, it evangelized all of Asia as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Timothy was a pastor and a bishop there. And then John himself was a pastor and a bishop there for at least 20 years. It is widely believed by most scholars that at the time of this writing, the church at Ephesus is what we call a second generation church. It's about 40 years old now. The original born-again believers at Ephesus now have raised their families. Many of the people who are now in the congregation were raised in the congregation. It is what we call a second generation church. Well, with all of that in mind, and there's so much more about the city, but just giving you an overview, uh, it is a port city, it is a deep water port, it is a center of commerce, it had a lot of government activity there also, but the church there was very mature and well-founded, pastored by Apollos and Paul and Timothy and John. Who could beat that? And when you read the epistle to the Ephesians, you get the feeling they were very mature. The doctrinal content of the book of Ephesians is very deep indeed. And so they were a very mature church. But let's listen to what he says to them. And this is chapter 2 of Revelation now, 1 through 7. And to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So who is Jesus to them? How is he portraying himself? I'm the one that's in your midst and I am holding you. Here's verse 2. I know your works and your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those that say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars, and you have, uh, and you have persevered and have had patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, in this church, there were all five. There was a portrayal of Christ. He's the one who holds the seven stars and he's the one who walks in their midst. And as he's reminding them that he is present with them and he holds them. Well, look at the praise that he has for this church. He says, I know your endurance and your, your, your patience. I know your doctrinal purity. In verse 2, he talks about their energetic labor. They, they worked hard for the Lord. He also notes to them uh, that they would not tolerate those that would say they are apostles, but really are not. And so they were doctrinally pure, they were active, they were busy. But he said, I've got something against you. You have left your first love. You have left your first love. And isn't love the supremacy of all? If, if I, I do all these great things, 1 Corinthians 13 says, but if I do not have love, I am nothing, and it profits me nothing. And so here's a church with Jesus in their midst, second generation, but they've lost their first love. And this, this word for leave, or you've left your first love, aphiasis, it means to leave or to send away. It's used for, for divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, 11 through 13. We could more literally translate this word, you've divorced your first love. And he says, I'm going to remove your candlestick if you don't repent. And what does he mean by remove your candlestick? The word remove here is an interesting word. It is the Greek word konosko. And it actually means to empty out. It's a key word in Philippians chapter 2, for example. But that lampstand had oil in it. And as long as it had oil in it, the flame could keep going. But, but Jesus said, because you've left your first love, I'm going to empty you out. And that's how you'll be removed. Your flame is going to go out and you're going to die as a church. You're going to be removed because your flame is going out. Oh, what a, a great warning this is. Because all of us need to be aware of the danger of apostasy. And here they weren't giving in to any false doctrine. They were very active, very hardworking. But their flame was going out. And their, their candlestick is in danger of being removed because they've lost their first love. So what's the portrayal of Christ? Well, I hold you and I'm in your midst. 
What is the uh, uh, praise? Well, you're hardworking and, and you keep your doctrine pure. But what's the problem? You've left your first love. We could pause here and take personal inventory because there's many Christians as well as many local churches that are in the same condition today. Doctrinal purity, all kinds of activity. But where's the love? Where's the passion for Jesus? He says to them, remember from whence you are fallen. Here's the prescription. Remember from whence you are fallen. Remember what it was like when you were loving Jesus. Remember what it was like when everything you did was motivated by love. And then he says, repent and do the first works. Repent and get back to those basics of worship and prayer and devotion and being in love with Jesus. And notice the promise. He says, if you overcome, he that hath an ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, what is paradise? What is this tree of life? That's the garden of God. It's, where, it's a reference to Eden and where Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Fellowship. Love. So here's a church that needs to repent even though they have doctrinal purity, even though they are energetic in their labor, yet they need to repent and do the first works. Well, what happened to the church at Ephesus? We could go on and on about what causes you to lose your love for the Lord, but what happened to the church at Ephesus? Here's what happened. As years went by, they, they were using the surrounding area to cut down timber. Because being a port city, they could cut down the trees and easily ship them out all around the region. And they weren't replanting those trees. So every time they had a heavy rainfall, a lot of dirt would erode down into the harbor. And over the years, that harbor that once was a deep port began, began to get more shallow and more shallow as more erosion came in and more erosion came in to the place where large cargo ships were, could no longer go in there. It wasn't deep enough anymore. And so the shipping trade began to slow up and then it began to evaporate and the city died. If you go to Ephesus today, it's not in the same location. There's an Ephesus today, but it's built further inland and it's not the same city. In other words, because they uh, did not replant and keep fresh things growing, erosion occurred and they became very shallow and they died as a city. I hope you see the spiritual analogy there. We can't stay, we can't stay stagnant for long. We've, we've got to stay growing. Uh, what is it that's eroding into your port? What is it that you're allowing to come in that's making you more shallow than you used to be? And the book of Revelation gives a stern warning to those who say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm a tour and I know all the doctrine, but where's the love? This is a church that eventually died when the city died because they did not heed the words of Jesus. I trust you and I will heed the words of Jesus. Well, we're going to continue our study of these seven churches. Uh, next lesson, we're going to look at another couple of churches. But let's just reflect a little bit of where we've been. Jesus is in the midst. And Jesus is holding the church. Church is doctrinally pure and very active. But they've left their first love. Their flame is going out. Let's not just make this an academic class. I trust that you and I will apply this to our own life. Are we as in love with Jesus as we used to be? And is our flame burning as brightly as it used to? If not, let's repent and do the first works. For from you are all